My poor garden is looking like an abandoned post-industrial wasteland at the moment. It's early February and the cold weather, tempered by idleness, have stopped me from getting cracking. Not all veg gardens in this village are run by duffers like me. This garden farm belongs to my friends Juliet and Steve. If I was ever going to do a food self-sufficient year, that's a joke by the way, I'd like to have a garden like this one. They've planted a food wood with fruit, nuts, berries and vines. They have beautiful no-dig veg beds. Look at this garlic. There are hunting posts for owls and raptors, a wetland area. It's a massive achievement and a pleasure to wander around. And look at this, you've got this plethora of, uh, of, uh, of veg growing. Talk me through what you've got here, what have you got? We've got, we've got a number of Chinese leaves, we've got pak choy, we've got joy choy, we've got mustards, we've got a lot of salads. Salads took a real pasting in the minus 10 we achieved yeah. in the, with the frosts because the tunnel went down to minus 10, Lord knows what it was outside, but yeah. um, that killed, it even killed beans, broad beans that we had in trays on the staging, which were due to go out into one of the beds outside. And they just got a lot massacred. of your brassicas outside got killed. Purple sprouting, or virtually all of it, I think around about 90% stems froze and were frozen for so long that when they thawed, yeah. they just fell over and just collapsed. Yeah, yeah. We lost most of our kales. So most of the winter brassicas that we would have expected to have had lots of come the spring, mm. sort of, you know, Valentine's Day and growth starts to kick on. Yeah, yeah. Nothing, nothing. But what we've got in the tunnel is, is, is a number of kales. We've got enough to keep us and the family and close friends going and one of the little venues that we, we right. supply to in the village. It's, it's lifestyle, but at the same time, we, we, we decided that, you know, it's a significant amount of money to invest in something like this. It needs to wash its face. Yeah. It doesn't need to make a massive profit. We're not trying to, you know, live off it, which I think, you know, most people who try to do that would struggle in the environment of land prices and, and everything else. But we, we grow and we try and make sure that with our local community, we can provide food at, at reasonable prices for very well grown, naturally grown, no chemicals, no herbicides or pesticides. Um, so, you know, yeah, we, we, we do sell some of it, but primarily, you know, the vegetables are for us. Self-sufficiency is a very solitary activity for me and spending time with friends who are doing the same thing is comforting. My morning's been great. I mean, I looked at the frost this morning and it looked odd. It was minus five last night and it looked odd on the ground here. And I discovered an un half an undug row of potatoes, which I'm just thrilled by. There's quite a lot here. And you think it's been minus 10. I mean, that's amazing that they've survived or lots of them have. So that's been brilliant news. And I'm incredibly excited about having some more potatoes. Um, and my bees are flying and there's pollen going into their hive, which is an indication that they've got babies. So it's good. But I have been feeling a bit sort of guilty uh, that I can't get on. Every night we had these really, really hard frosts. If I did have anything, you know, growing in the polytile, it would be being toasted. So, and seeds wouldn't be germinating and stuff. It's just way too cold. So um, I've been making loads and loads of cheese. Um, and that's just about all I've been doing, milking and making loads of cheese, which has been being very successful. And I feel like I'm storing up, you know, for, uh, for later on when I won't have time to do things like that.
But he like, he wants loads of milk, but he doesn't need it at all. So this bit of a tussle with her, where I, she's got four quarters in her udder, I leave one quarter for the calf. And um, he's finding it quite frustrating. I've been saving two days of milk, about 20 litres, two or three times a week, to make cheese. Today is cheddar. Very well, that's what we want. If you're new to cheese making, the milk is inoculated with lactic acid cultures and then curdled with rennet, which is what happens naturally in a calf's stomach. The curds are then cut and shrunk in the whey before being separated and then stacked to allow the acids to develop. Cut this curd in half. Like that. And I'm gonna lift up that half and flop it over. What I need to do is to press my cheese and dairy equipment's really, really expensive and so I've, I've made my own. So this is my cheese press made out of uh, some M12 rebar and a few nuts and a bit of plywood. And this is my cheese um, mould, which is made out of a piece of six inch soil pipe. Show that again. Here. It's just an ordinary piece of brown six inch soil pipe. I've drilled lead holes in it. It takes most of the day to make a cheese and six months to mature cheddar. I'm not a cheese making expert and so rather than show you how I do things, I thought it'd be better to cut to the chase and show you what I end up with after all the work and the waiting is done. It's hard. Harder than I was expecting. So is it kind of a surprise you don't know what this is going to be like? They're all different, yeah. Um, I pressed this quite hard. There are very few fissures and gaps in this one. Cheese makers describe uh, cheddar that's not quite mature as being quiet. And um, the last one I opened I thought was quite that was quite quiet. This one is, uh, I think, going to be stronger. What makes them quiet or stronger? Um, it's how the acids develop in the maturing process. And so, when to, when people talk about a very very strong cheddar, what they're talking about is is a, a real strong acid taste. Um, anyway, let's taste what this one looks taste like. 31st of January vintage. It's a really good hard te texture. Um, and it tastes nice and mature and really firm. It's quite well made. Well made. So it's quite crumbly. I think that's part of its marginal storage when the, when it got so hot. Do you want to try some? Try that bit. That's so good. Nice, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, I think I just want to understand how, yeah, how much the animals play a part of this kind of way of living. Uh, where the grass grows. Uh, cattle make complete sense in a farming system. They provide fertility, they're part of crop rotation, um, they are utilising an asset, grass, which we can't utilise. If you want to grow crops, uh, you want to put the plot of land down to grass for two or three years, the cows eat it, and then when you come to plant wheat and potatoes, it grows spectacularly well, and you don't have to smother it in um, in bought-in commercial fertilizers made in the Ukraine from, you know, from gas. Um, it's an incredibly important part of the organic organic rotation um, uh, in traditional farming. 
Is it just the fact that we are farming animals on this mass scale? Yeah, absolutely. And and uh, and, and I can so so understand how uh, in in just a short period of time I can so understand how we can farm animals in an ethical way that that fits with the land and the farming process to produce healthy organic sustainable food uh, and we do that by eating less meat and uh, but we don't stop eating meat absolutely not because uh, because uh, farm animals have a hugely important role to play in um, in our farming system especially in England well especially in England on heavy you know heavy wetland like mine you know grass grows brilliantly um, in uh, in Somerset apples grow brilliantly in Somerset and what do we have as a tradition of our food in Somerset cider and cheese you know we're world famous for cider and cheese and that's because those are the crops that do best on our on our land. Uh, it doesn't happen not doesn't happen by accident. It happens for a reason. Um, yeah, really important. There's lots of bird song. Really? Yeah. What were you thinking of? I was just thinking how beautiful the bird song is, and I'm just suddenly must be something about today that they really like, because it's the first day. It's been reasonably mild, a little bit of sunshine, and I'm out here all the time, and I'm just—it's the cacophony of bird song suddenly. So someone on Twitter said, "Why aren't you?" growing sprouting seeds and I said because I'm not allowed to grow anything that hasn't been in the ground for at least three months part of my rule is it's to stop me from being able to go and buy a sheep taking it straight into the abattoir bringing it home putting it in the freezer and saying I'm eating my own mutton or for me to buy a lemon tree at the garden center put it in the ground take the lemons off it and saying I've got my own lemon so I have a three-month rule where I'm only, uh, something's got to be growing in the ground for three months. And so the, uh, the very nice person on Twitter said, why aren't I growing sprouting seeds? And I said, well, I've got to have three months. And they said, that's nonsense. You know, I mean, radishes only take six weeks growing in the ground and lettuces only take 10 weeks. So, you know, why are you bothering? And they, they all thought that sprouting seeds was a good way to go. So Mrs. Max let me buy these two very posh jars, sprouting seed jars. And I bought some sprouting seeds, and this is what they look like after six days. I've got literally like a whole week's worth of seed sprouts in one go. And they're really delumptious, really delumptious. They feel like they're really doing you good. Very difficult to eat. So these are mung beans. That's really yummy in there. And that's only from two tablespoonfuls in the jar when you start. Got a whole jar full. And this is um, a mixture of alfalfa and broccoli. They're really nice to eat on their own. I haven't been eating anything like this for six months. It's just like luxury. Like crunchy. Since I had, you know, salads in the autumn. Haven't had anything like this, gorgeous. <laughs>